brilliant engineer dreams of conquering space with the biggest gun ever built. It would have been over 500 feet long, two football fields end to end. But to bring his super gun to life, he must make a deal with the devil. Saddam Hussein was known for turning on his allies. And when his work becomes a global threat. If you don't stop, they will take lethal action against you. His ambition may lead to a deadly downfall. I will prove I am the best. On the evening of March 22, 1990, world-renowned ballistic scientist Dr. Gerald Boll returns home to his apartment in Brussels, Belgium. Safe at home, he lets his guard down, which turns out to be his last mistake. He was walking in the corridor to his apartment when somebody stepped up behind him, fired a number of shots. This is not the work of an amateur. To guarantee a kill there, you, you do two bullets to the head. Then when you check his pulse, to see if he was dead, and he was. He was killed instantly. Belgian police rush to the scene. It's immediately clear that robbery isn't the motive. $20,000 that was on his body was left untouched. No traces were left. No fingerprints were left. The money and the lack of physical evidence point to just one conclusion, assassination. It was a professional job. I was told that he had been shot, and there's no words to describe that. Bull's son, Michel, must break the news to his siblings and mom. That was the really, really hard part, telling the rest of my family, my mom specifically. It was probably the most horrendous thing I've done in my life. Bull's death sends shockwaves through the intelligence community. For the last two years, he's been under surveillance by agencies from around the world, gathering intel on his top secret highly dangerous project. There was a major investigation across Europe uh, and the United States. It involved CIA, MI6, French intelligence, Spanish intelligence. It was a major coordinated effort. Bull has been working on a weapon capable of mass destruction. And his death sends intelligence agencies scrambling to find its location. After a frantic two-week search, there's a breakthrough some 500 miles away in Teesport, England. Customs officers seize eight huge steel tubes. According to the shipping manifest, they're pipes for the petroleum industry. But these are no ordinary oil pipes. The segments were of such tight tolerances that it couldn't have been for a petrochemical project. Their discovery is the missing piece to a diabolical puzzle. Bull has been secretly manufacturing components for his weapon in a network of locations across Europe. The parts are to be assembled into an intercontinental cannon of unprecedented power. A super gun, nicknamed Big Babylon. The Babylon gun would have weighed about 2,000 tons. It would have been over 500 feet long. It's two football fields end to end. And it would have been 40 inches, more than a yard in diameter. 
It's completely radical. There's never been any gun even remotely similar to this ever built. This would have fired a projectile on the order of 500 pounds, the largest artillery projectile ever fired. The most disturbing discovery is where these parts are headed, Iraq and its brutal dictator, Saddam Hussein. Finding the barrel sections before they are shipped has snatched the world's biggest gun out of his hands. There was a major investigation taking place across Europe and the United States into how Iraq was getting the materials for the supergun that resulted in the exposure of the whole network, in fact. But the mystery of Gerald Bull's assassination remains. Working on a supergun for an Iraqi dictator could place Bull on any number of hit lists. The Iranians could have been behind the assassination. It could have been China. Perhaps Saddam Hussein thought he could get along without Bull. They could have been ex-SAS people. He worked for an enemy of the state of Israel. There could be many people who would want him dead. Whoever killed Bull, one thing is certain. His science was directly linked to his death. The 1950s, the dawn of the Cold War. It's also one of the most exciting periods in engineering history. Time to think and to try. And working right at the heart of this new frontier is young aerodynamicist Gerald Bull. He was an engineer, a problem solver, able to flip over an envelope and do a quick calculation that people on computers might spend months trying to solve. Soviet and Western scientists are locked in a race to outdo each other, fighting to be at the cutting edge of supersonics, missile technology, and space. Problems of supersonic flight, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, these were the most pressing problems for the Cold War and the nascent space age. You know, these things were uh, do or die, you know. Born in Canada, Bull is working for the country's armament and research establishment on Project Velvet Glove, a supersonic missile designed to bring down enemy aircraft. Seen here being typically hands-on, Bull gains a reputation for his unique approach to problem solving. In many respects, Bull was the original MacIver. He was able to take things that other people had seen as straightforward science, straightforward technology, spin it in different ways and come up with a different solution, a radically different solution. For Bull, it's the beginning of a lifelong love affair with guns and how they might be used for scientific research. His expertise becomes crucial in 1957, when the Soviet Union takes the lead in the space race, launching a satellite into Earth's orbit, Sputnik. One of the great scientific feats of the age. America is falling behind. Whoever owns space could conquer the world. Destined for a target within our borders. Space becomes the new frontier of war. Satellites go about in space and have things on them that can threaten Earth. By the end of the 1950s, Bull has developed a radical idea that will shape the course of his future. An alternative to expensive rocket launches. He envisions a super howitzer that could fire satellites into space straight from the barrel of a gun. It's a technology that could launch the U.S. into the lead in the space race. He was imagining five-foot-wide bore on the gun, absolutely enormous. He felt that there was really no limit to what could be achieved.
Gerald Bold dreams of the biggest gun the world has ever seen. Maybe even taller than the Empire State Building. Bold only intends to use the gun to launch payloads into space. But it soon becomes clear that much more dangerous cargo could be deployed from the gun. What Bull was really doing was pushing the envelope of what was possible scientifically. He didn't see himself particularly as a warfare warrior. He saw himself as a space warrior. But that's not how everybody sees his work. It clearly had military objectives, a gigantic field artillery piece as its main mission. This is what they've been waiting for. The deadline is 90 days. In 1961, at the height of the Cold War, Gerald Bohl is a brilliant Canadian scientist with a unique obsession using powerful guns for scientific research in the U.S. space race. Three, two, one, fire command. While the world fixates on the future, Bull draws inspiration from the past. An extreme range howitzer developed by the Germans during World War I, known as the Paris gun. The Paris gun had a range about 10 times that of most other field guns. It was wider, it carried a huge explosive charge and a large shell. It's an artillery innovation that has the Allies reeling when it shells Paris in 1918 from a range of 74 miles. At this stage of the war, it was very unexpected that artillery rounds would start exploding in the streets of Paris. It gives Bull an idea. If the Germans had been able to do a range of 74 miles, why couldn't he do a range of 2,000 miles? What about 5,000 miles? But unlike the German innovators, Bull isn't focusing on the military application of such a gun. He wants to launch a satellite into orbit. Bull's idea was that you could take a howitzer or an artillery piece, expand it enormously, make it much longer, put in an enormous propellant charge, and send a payload into a low Earth orbit. The savings would be enormous, from what would be $200,000 in today's money down to under $10,000 per launch. Up until that point, everyone's idea of launching satellites was simply to use a very large rocket. So Bull had a very unique concept. Here's a model of the Martlet space shell in Barbados. After much lobbying from Gerald Bull, in March of 1962, the United States and Canada's Departments of Defense joined forces to develop his super gun in a program called HARP. High Altitude Research Project. HARP was designed primarily for space research, the flight of missiles, the use of radar penetrating through the upper atmosphere, whether you could, in fact, use guns to fire projectiles into space. The US Army donates two rundown 410 millimeter Navy guns from 1922 and transports them to Barbados, where HARP is to be based. Now, Bull is able to focus on his greatest engineering challenge yet. He would need to use a lot of gunpowder to launch a heavy projectile. And if all that gunpowder went off at once, the reservoir or the breech of the gun would just explode. It's not just the gun that needs some rethinking, but the projectiles themselves. Projectiles that were launched under Project Harp would experience tens of thousands of times the normal acceleration you experience due to the Earth's gravity. So this would destroy a human being or any delicate instrument. True to form, Bull has a radically simple solution. Extend the length of the barrel. A long barrel has two advantages. It has a greater distance for acceleration, which reduces g-force on the projectile. You wanted to lower the load on the projectile, 
but uh, still reach a very high speed. So Bull welds his two barrels together to create a giant 135-foot-long howitzer. It's christened Betsy, the biggest gun in history. And Bull points it towards the sky. On January 20th, 1963, Betsy fires her first test. Ah! A wooden projectile that reaches nearly two miles into the sky. Dr. Bull, you've been working for this day for two years. How do you feel now? Well, we feel pretty good after that shot. But the following day is the real event, launching one of Bull's custom-designed projectiles. It reaches a height of 16 miles, and it's just the beginning. The projectiles that were launched in their Project Harp looked more like rockets than they did military shells. Some of them had fins that were designed to deploy to keep them stable in flight. They were instrumented scientific payloads that could survive, launch, and actually send data back as they were flying out of the Earth's atmosphere. Bull knows he can launch a working satellite without damaging it. With each launch, Bull is racing farther into the ionosphere passing milestones at breakneck pace. Uh -huh. ah! Bull's son, Michel, then nine years old, remembers it well. And the firings were so impressive because you would hear the countdown and then you'd see the flame. And a couple of seconds later, you would hear the bang and then that's the second jolt. For the next three years, Bull relentlessly tests, refines, and redesigns his missiles. By November 18, 1966, Bull's Martlet II projectile reaches 111 miles. But reaching space isn't enough. Bull wants to go 10 times farther and put rocket-assisted projectiles into orbit, all from the barrel of a gun. What Bull imagined was having a gun that instead of being 30 feet long was 300 feet long, or even 500 or even 1,500 feet long. But big ambitions come with big risks. And Bull's obsession is leading him to dangerous new territory. We were crossing a line because the super gun will always be seen as, as, as weaponry. Gerald Bull's Project Harp for the U.S. and Canada succeeds in reaching space. But he wants to go even further by putting a projectile into orbit. Yet, on the heels of Bull's triumph comes unwelcome change. As NASA's rocket technology leaps ahead with the Gemini and Apollo programs, Bull's guns are being left behind. The space program more widely was successful. Bull was very much on the margins. In June 1967, Project Harp loses funding. The plug is pulled without ever achieving Bull's dream of reaching orbital space. Bull is devastated. My father was obsessed. So anything to stop his program would upset him uh, terribly. But really, my father never left the idea. Bull feels abandoned by the American and Canadian governments. And he becomes more determined to find another way to fund his vision, no matter what or how long it takes. Like a lot of brilliant people, it's the ego that drives them forward. I will prove I am the best. And that was very much him. Bull ships the remains of Project Harp to his lab at Highwater a compound straddling the border of the U.S. and Canada. He had no money, nowhere to go, but he had an opportunity, he had ideas for making a better artillery system. But Bull must now look beyond North America for funding. 
he begins working with Iran, Taiwan, Vietnam, and Israel, eventually signing deals with over 30 countries, developing their military capabilities as an international Mr. Fix-It. He continued his research into artillery, and he was also a freelance artillery consultant. Money is flowing in from America's friends and enemies. And Bull sees an even better business opportunity, putting his expertise on long barrel guns to work. He builds a formidable mobile long range artillery gun named the GC-45. The GC-45 had a very long, very efficient gun barrel, and it had some unique ammunition, which allowed it to fire to much longer ranges. In 1976, Bull finds an eager buyer, the South African military. They're fighting communism in Angola with America's covert support. But during the apartheid era, there's an international arms embargo against South Africa. Bull can't legally sell them his GC-45s. So he secretly sells them the blueprints and the shells to go with it. What Bull was able to do was smuggle around 50,000 shells to South Africa. It's an operation made easier when once again the U.S. embraces Bull's technology. According to some, the CIA even helps broker the deal. Bull was reassured that he was operating with the support of the U.S. government and if you're operating covertly, you can apparently get away with anything. For three years, he successfully trades arms with South America and flies under the radar, until a change in US foreign policy. The focus shifted from fighting communism to fighting apartheid and human rights violations. Suddenly, Bull finds himself in the U.S. government's crosshairs. In 1980, it makes an example out of Gerald Bull. He faces trial for illegal arms dealing. He agreed to plead guilty to what he thought was a minor charge, but he was sent to jail. He became a pariah in the U.S. And, and the Canadian government. Nobody would touch him, nobody would talk to him and whatnot. Michel is 24 when his father, Gerald, is sentenced to six months in prison. While Bull is behind bars, his business collapses and his research facility, Highwater, is sold. With it goes his life's mission of creating a super gun. When he came out of jail, he was very, very bitter uh, against the US and the Canadian government and everybody else. He was just bitter against the world. Bull has become a US citizen, but his future in America has been destroyed. With no money and no friends, he leaves for the one place he knows he can find work, the center of the international arms trade, Brussels. It was, for me, very touching to see him alone, bitter, and just living out of suitcases. And uh, I kind of felt, well, I have to go and help him out. With his then 25-year-old son, Michel, by his side, Bull hopes to rebuild the space research company from the ground up. He just needs a big client. And in the 1980s, there's one man who's the biggest draw of all, Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. Saddam had grandiose ambitions, and so did uh, Bull. So it was a marriage made in heaven, really. I was concerned for sure. Did I actually believe that it would contribute to his death? No. Embittered with America after being sent to prison, in 1981, Gerald Bull moves to Brussels, Belgium, the center of international arms trading. His dream of building a super gun that can send a payload to space seems further away from him than ever. 
he desperately needs funding to rebuild his weapons company. He re-enters the arms trade with his son Michel by his side. Our first big contract in Europe was with China. It took a long while to negotiate. We would work 12 hours a day in the office, and that's what he did, seven days uh, a week for sure. In the few hours he has to himself, Bull fixates on his life's work. His super howitzer capable of launching payloads into orbit. So Bull always kept his dream of the space gun alive, and he would talk uh, about it to anyone who would listen. In 1985, after years of living in exile, Bull is invited back to the Pentagon to pitch his space gun. He was still at that time bitter against the American government. And yet, being invited back to talk about his life work on Supergun was something very exciting for him. But the meeting does not go as planned for Bull. The U.S. again rejects his project. And again, it appears he will never achieve his dream of bringing the Supergun to life. Until in December 1987, he finds support in an unlikely corner of the world, Iraq. The Iraqi government under Saddam Hussein was very interested in long-range artillery because they had been fighting a long war with Iran, and artillery was a central part of that conflict. But Iran and Iraq are subjected to an international arms ban during the conflict. No deals can be done with Saddam until the fighting is over. One of the things that I insisted on when I worked with my dad is it had to be legal. I did not want a repeat of the South African affair. They can't sell guns to Iraq, but it's a chance to use Bull's engineering expertise in a whole new area. They had huge development program. They had 11 dams slated to, to be built along the Tigris and the Euphrates. And we were going to be working in helping them in the engineering of all of that. The Iraqis also want to launch a civilian space program, a first for the Arab world. And that catches Gerald Bull's attention. He travels to Iraq in January 1988 to discuss business opportunities. He's treated like royalty and is joined by his son. My first visit to Iraq was quite eye-opening. Okay, we were extremely well received. They were very, very courteous to us. Clearly, the Iraqis held my dad in really, really high regards from a scientific perspective. Bull sees an irresistible opportunity. Without Michel's knowledge, he pitches his space gun. For Bull, here was a, a country that wanted to try to establish the ability to launch satellites into space, and this was his dream going back to the early 1960s. And finally, with the Iraqis, he found a receptive audience. After years of being rejected, at last Bull is given the chance to fulfill his dream. Iraq offered to fund his project, and, you know, for him, that was the ultimate, you know, uh, prize. Bull's lifelong vision of building a supergun is finally within reach. But signing this deal may seal his fate. Basically, we're crossing a line. In 1988, after years of rejection, ballistics expert 60-year-old Dr. Gerald Bull is finally offered the chance to fulfill his life's dream. Developing an immense howitzer capable of launching payloads into orbit. Detailed here in this previously classified CIA paper, its nickname, Project Babylon. Bull's idea for Project Babylon was to use a big gun as a reusable substitute for the first stage of a space rocket. The gun could be big and heavy, reliable, 
and if anything breaks, you just go out and fix it. After America turns its back on him, his obsession has led him to deal with the only man willing to fund his project, Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. No Arab country had the ability to launch satellites, and this would have been an enormous coup for the Iraqis. With the end of the Iran-Iraq War in 1988, the arms ban against Iraq is lifted. But increasingly, the Western world sees Saddam Hussein as a brutal dictator. And Michel is concerned his father has gone too far. Why was I so adamant against it? Iraq had just come out of a very nasty war with Iran. It is a dictatorship. And so for, for a number of reasons, I felt that this was more prone to land us into problems. And eventually, I kind of said to my dad, well, I, I can't go on. Uh, I need to, to pull out. His own son walks away. But Bull's obsession is too great to be stopped. With a small team of trusted scientists, Bull sets up a new company and begins building the gun he's been dreaming of. The initial weapon to be developed was called Baby Babylon, and this had a caliber of 350 millimeters. The next stage would have been to develop two super guns with a caliber of 1,000 millimeters, and this would have been the largest artillery system ever built. He sets out to create a history-making 500-foot barrel. Bull will need to connect 26 sections of pipe together. With so many points of weakness, the structural integrity of the barrel is at risk. So Bull uses his engineering genius to develop a new steel alloy three times stronger than construction steel. Now, the barrel can withstand twice the pressure. But it's not the last of his hurdles. He also had to develop the projectiles. And given the limited facilities he had at his availability, this was a significant challenge. He was working on conventional non-powered projectiles. He was also working on rocket-assisted projectiles. He was working on different types of payloads. He was working on different types of guidance systems. In the remote Iraqi desert, the first stage of Project Babylon is secretly assembled. The Baby Babylon gun, weighing 113 tons, with a 150-foot long and 350-millimeter wide barrel. An immense construction, but still only a third of the size Bull wants to achieve. In May 1989, Baby Babylon begins testing. It's designed to launch a projectile over 460 miles. They demonstrated with the smaller Baby Babylon gun that they could solve all of the technical hurdles needed to build the ultimate Project Babylon gun. The wheels begin to turn on the next phase of the project. In factories across Europe, the parts to create his first big Babylon gun roll into production. After being unable to get the US to fund his huge howitzer, Bull is now on the verge of fulfilling his life's dream. But this time, it's for Saddam Hussein. And it's not the only lethal weapon Bull is developing for the Iraqi dictator. Along with Babylon, he is working on a secret project codenamed Project Bird. The Iraqis approached Bull about an idea to combine several Scud missiles together to make a multi-stage launch vehicle they said would be for launching satellites. It's proposed to Bull as part of Iraq's civilian space program. But they have a far more lethal use in mind as an intercontinental missile system. And that gave these missiles enough power to reach Israel. But his work isn't as top secret as Bull thinks. Israel, in fact, suspects what he is attempting to build. The Israelis were worried about the bunching of the Scud missiles. But I came clearly to tell them this is what we believe you're doing. 
We don't want this done. If you do it, the Israeli government is getting, gonna get real mad at you. In March 1990, world-renowned artillery genius Dr. Gerald Bohl is on the verge of building the biggest howitzer in history for Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. Maybe around 15% of the gun might have been in place. All the rest of it was component parts that were coming in from all over the world. On March 22nd, Bull returns home in Belgium from another day working on Project Babylon. When a mystery gunman approaches him outside his apartment and shoots and kills him. A bullet from behind means he never knows what hit him. He dies believing his dream of building a supergun is finally becoming a reality. This is no random murder. This is a textbook assassination. A small caliber gun is used because it does two things. You don't hear it, and there's not a lot of splatter. But who ordered the hit? To this day, it's a whodunit that haunts those close to Bowl. And the possibilities are endless. Bowl is taking lucrative arms deals away from UK companies, leading to speculation that his competitors took him out. There was a CIA report that shows that it would be an assassination that was emanating from UK interest, not governmental, but UK uh, companies. Bull has had many business partners. In an industry with a dark underbelly, perhaps a disgruntled client wants revenge. Even his current employer is under suspicion. Saddam Hussein was known for turning on his allies. Perhaps Saddam Hussein thought he could get along without Bull, eliminate Bull, and the secrets would never be told. But why kill him before Big Babylon and the Scud missile proposal are built? Iraq has no shortage of enemies. Could one of them be to blame? The Iranians would have had reason to be angry with Bull, who was now assisting their great rival Iraq to develop his artillery capabilities. It was just two years after the war between Iran and Iraq, and the Iranians were working on reconstructing their economy, rebuilding their military, learning lessons from the war, and I don't think they were in the business of going after one single scientist who was helping Saddam Hussein. For others, the manner in which Bull was killed points the blame at Israel's spy agency, the Mossad. The guy that shot him in the head shot him twice. That's the MO for the Mossad. He worked for an enemy of the State of Israel. He was trying to produce a lethal weapon that can be used against Israel. But it may not be the supergun that most worries the Israelis. The Israelis didn't believe that the supergun would work in any case. They weren't worried about that. Large guns are totally fixed. You can't move them. You can't hide them. They can be taken out like that twist of, of a finger, and that's it. But Bull's work on the Scud missile may have put him on Israel's radar and provided a motive to take him out. Former Israeli intelligence agent Ari ben Menashe claims that in 1989, he's dispatched to Brussels to deliver a chilling warning to the weapons genius. I was working uh, for the Israeli intelligence at the time. And I spoke to Bull and told him pretty openly that we knew everything that was going on. I told him the Israeli government, they're passing on a message to you. 
If you don't stop, they will take lethal action against you. I was very clear. I was told to be clear. Michelle Bull is skeptical that his father ever received that warning. This is something that upsets me a lot because he was not a stupid man. He would have talked to us and we need to change something, we need to stop something or whatever. I don't think that he was ever warned. If the hit really is ordered by Israel, it's possible they aren't the only ones who know about Bull's work for Iraq. I think the Israelis killed Gerald Bull because they were afraid. But I would have thought that the Israelis would have had to take permission or at least notify the Americans of the problem. And within hours of Bull's murder, the CIA hands the Belgian police a full dossier on him. The fact that they supplied information in such a short time makes us wonder as to whether or not there was a US role in, in his assassination whether it be from just acknowledging and quote and unquote authorizing it or whatever. To this day, exactly who ordered Gerald Bowles' death and why remains shrouded in mystery. I still today, 27 years after his death, do not know who and why my father was killed. There's so many misdirection that it's just very, very hard to find out the truth, and I kind of made up our minds that we never will. Whoever decided that Bull had to die, the connection to his super gun is no coincidence. His dream of the gun led him to get involved with the Iraqis, and his involvement of the Iraqis is almost certainly what led to his death. Gerald Bull dies at the age of 62 in the pursuit of his life's dream brought down by his deadly obsession. It was a sad end to what could have been a pretty amazing life.